Segment two, national security and Iraq. From George W. Bush's second inaugural address, quote, as long as whole regions of the world simmer in resentment and tyranny, violence will gather. The survival of our liberty increasingly depends on the success of liberty in other lands. The best hope for peace in our world is the expansion of freedom in all the world, close quote. Now, when you listen to those words in January of 2005, we got that right? Right. Uh, did you say to yourself, ooh, that's an overreach, or that's exactly right, or, well, that's a politician talking, it's too fuzzy to evaluate. Yeah, actually, I, I mean, I, and from talking to President Bush over the years on this, I think he, f he had a, a deep belief in this, and I think he was correct. In other words, <clears throat> on a strategic basis, if you're looking to change the conditions that yield terrorism or that yield people who are um, uh, trying to, to kill us, what you want to do is you need to change the conditions on the ground. You need to create societies with a rule of law where there's opportunity, where there is no corruption, and where you have you know, a reasonable degree of freedom and, and human rights. That creates societies that are less likely to breed terrorism and violence. Um, if all you're doing is dealing with the, with the results of, right. of societies that are, are um, dysfunctional, then it's like playing whack-a-mole. You're going to keep right. hitting the mole right. and you're not going to change the game. Right. So I think the president was, was right about that. And now, obviously you want to transition there over a period of time in a way that right. doesn't right. result in violent upheaval. But at the end of the day, I think freedom and democracy and the rule of law are the ingredients of peace. So you subscribe to the Bush freedom agenda in principle strongly. Correct. Okay. So that raises the question of costs. And let me just hit, hit you with it. Here's the cost of the war in Iraq. 4,400 American personnel dead, 35,000 wounded. Somewhere, it's really hard to get a tight <coughs> estimate, but somewhere between <coughs> 700 billion and 1.5 trillion spent. And the estimates of Iraqi dead run from 70,000 to more than 100,000. Those estimates also are all over the place, but it was a lot of people. Was that worth it? Well, let's go back to where we were in 2003. Right. And, and judge it based on what was known at the time. I don't think that the president um, argued that we're invading Iraq simply in order to make it into a democratic regime. Mm -hmm. um, although clearly that was a benefit that was hoped for and I think has been largely achieved, <clears throat> I think the original impetus was, was the belief held in good faith that Saddam Hussein had or had ready access to weapons of mass destruction, at a minimum chemical and biological weapons, and he'd used those weapons in the past, right. and perhaps a nuclear program that was moving along. Now, we can argue after the fact about why it is that that was misjudged. A lot of it, frankly, was that, that Saddam Hussein tried to project that image right. that he had it. Right. But that's the reason we went into Iraq. It's not simply because we wanted to get democracy. And I think that's, although achieving democracy was, I think, a hoped-for byproduct, I don't think that alone would have been a reason to go in. I don't think the president ever suggested that. All right. Um, you raised the question of intelligence. Right couple of quotations here. Daniel Dresner of the New Republic, writing in 2003, the CIA is in open revolt against the White House, close quote. Bill Kristol, writing in the Weekly Standard in 2007, a group of unelected bureaucrats from the CIA leaked almost daily against the White House. On this very program a couple of months ago, former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld said that he became so distrust, he said it here, he also has written it in his book, he became so distrustful of CIA that in, during the war, in the course of the war in Iraq, he said, I want no more briefings from CIA. I'll read the paper. Don't send me personnel. I don't want these people talking to me face to face. What was going on? Well, I have to say, from my perspective, I had no complaints about the CIA. I had a, uh, when I served as secretary from 2005 to 2009, secretary of Homeland Security, I got a regular CIA briefing. I found the, the, the analysis and the briefers uh, to be uh, really outstanding. I had no complaints or difficulties with the way they conducted really? themselves. Um, I was not. Is that really, because you were better at handling them? No, I think. It, I, I mean, I can't speak for what was in Secretary Rumsfeld's experience, and um, there may have been some policy issues there that are outside of what was in my domain. Right. But certainly, from my perspective, which was to uh, look at what intelligence there was concerning threats against the United States, mm -hmm. I found all the intelligence agencies uh, to, to be really outstanding in terms of their performance and also to work well together. I mean, we had a real ability uh, to fuse the information. So I have no complaints about that, and I can't speak for why others disagreed uh, or, or had some problem with the CIA, but I didn't have that experience. Really? So, so, but 
look, well, you were a member of the administration, cabinet meetings, you're seated yeah. in the cabinet room, you're at the table. Yeah. And did you not wonder to yourself, I can deal with CIA, they're being perfectly straightforward with me. Why is Rumsfeld having so much trouble? Why is there leaking against Cheney and the president? Didn't, it, didn't, well, it, didn't know, the disarray <clears throat> at least I, I strike say, you as you, odd? I, I would say the disarray perhaps looks more um, obvious from outside than so? it does from inside. Uh, and bear in mind, of course, I came in 2005, which is after the first couple of years of Iraq. So <clears throat> it was a, a different time frame than the period leading right up to the war right. And, and right after the war. But I also have a pretty, I think, a pretty good understanding of the difficulties uh, that are inherent in intelligence collection and analysis. You don't get a clear answer because you're always trying to assemble inferences <clears throat> from a lot of different facts. And you can argue those in different mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe I had a, a more reasonable expectation about what intelligence gives you uh, and what evidence really is than some people do when they, when they look at the CIA or other intelligence agencies. Uh, final question about Iraq. If you could, uh, we're, we're recording this on a university campus, right. um, kids who will graduate from Stanford University this June, already you're, you've, we've got students who don't quite remember the yeah. origins of the war, uh, they certainly won't remember the invasion in March of 2003. One sentence, two at the most, what's the lesson of Iraq? I think the lesson is when you make a decision based on information that you have at the time, there's always a risk that that information will turn out to be either proven wrong or the prediction will turn out not to uh, uh, eventuate the way you suppose. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't make decisions based on less than 100% information. What it means is you have to have a certain humility mm. uh, about what intelligence can give you so that when you make a judgment, you're in inherently aware that there is always some element of uncertainty about the information you've got and, and the predicted outcome. And if you're the president, that you communicate that element of uncertainty to the American I, people. I think that's that right. I, I, I think it's important for the president to communicate it, but to recognize that we live in a, in a media environment in, in which the subtleties <clears throat> are often um, overlooked. And I'll give you just a, a, mm -hmm. a short, quick example. I distinctly remember the president saying, we're not going to wait until the threat is imminent to go into Iraq. I remember that, too. I often heard people in the media accuse the president of saying the threat is imminent. Right, that was right, exactly right. the opposite of what right. he actually said. Right. So right. there's a great deal right. of difficulty sometimes in actually communicating to the audience um, given the filter of the media.